Now the notion of multi-programming versus time sharing. So this is an important operating system concept. On a high level, you know, multi-programming, in, in both cases, the operating system has multiple processes, multiple processes to handle. In a multi-programming system, the operating system is going to, uh, to give the CPU to one process, and it will wait until that process uh, requests I.O or has to go in the waiting state for other reasons. Uh, we will see other reasons for going into the waiting state later. But for now, uh, the only reason that we have covered for going into the waiting state is requesting I.O. So if a process uh, goes into the waiting state, the, uh, uh, the operating system is going to give the CPU to another process. That's multi-program. But Time sharing means that the kernel is not going to wait for a process to request I.O. or go into the waiting state. The kernel will keep switching between processes. Even if a process doesn't need to wait, the operating system is going to take the CPU from it and it's going to give it to another process. So let's draw it and then try to understand why. So this is uh, multi-programming. And this is time sharing. And again, these are uh, timing diagrams on the CPU. These are timing diagrams on the CPU. So here we have the kernel. Then the kernel is going to give the CPU to process number one. And at some point, process number one is going to request I.O. So the kernel will be in charge and it will give the CPU to process number two. But with time sharing, we have the kernel, then P1, and the kernel is not going to wait for P1 to request I.O. It's going to, at some point, it's going to take the CPU from P1 and give it to P2. Then the kernel is going to get the CPU again and possibly give it you know, to P1 or P3 or some other process. So let's assume here that it gives it to P1. Just as an example, right? So don't understand, you know, uh, don't think that time sharing is you know, alternating two processes. This is just one example. Uh, time sharing is switching between processes and uh, you, know, you may have many processes and we don't know, you know in which uh, you know, which process gets the CPU next? Like, you know, like I said, which process gets the CPU next is a scheduling decision. Okay, and then kernel, then P2, and so forth. <coughs> now, the question is, why would the operating system do this? Why would it keep switching like this? Yes. Um, I guess it's just <clears throat> when you when you're doing multi-processing, you're only doing that one process, and then you move on to another process. So it kind of does it share like in the time sharing, it makes it look like it's like everyone is like all the processes are being done at the same time. Yeah, it, I like you when you said it makes it look like. Yeah. yeah so in fact, it makes the users seem like they they have the advantage of like doing exactly, multiple tasks. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's about user experience. So the user here will feel that multiple processes are making progress. So if we assume that, uh, let's first assume that all of these processes belong to the same user. Like you are using your computer and you are typing on Microsoft Word and at the same time you have your browser active and uh, you have your email uh, active and your email is uh, receiving messages and when you get a message you get notified while you are typing, right? So there are multiple processes. So when, when this is happening, the user is getting the feel uh, that multiple processes are making progress. It, it, even though, you know, strictly speaking, only one of them will be on the CPU at any given point in time, but the user <coughs> will get the feel of that, uh, or the illusion that multiple processes are running at the same uh, time. So this is more responsive. So th th this system is going to be more responsive to the user. 
But it's not true. So saying that this is faster is not true. This is not faster, in fact. So when you say which one is faster, so you have to define faster. Faster is not well defined here. Because I can argue that this is faster, and I can argue that this is faster. I can argue that this is faster because basically this is the faster from user point of view. You know, if, if a user is using this and this, then uh, you know, the, the user uh, will feel that this is faster from user uh, experience point of view. But I can argue that this is faster. How? Ah, what's the argument? Yes, please. A single process finishes faster on multi-programming than time sharing. Like P1 finishes faster than mm -hmm. on time sharing. In fact, not only P1. You know, both of them, if you give it a certain period of time, so what's, if you ask, what's the total time needed to execute a given set of processes? So if you have, say in this example, we have P1 and P2, what's the total time needed to finish both P1 and P2 here? So the total time needed to finish them, assuming that, <coughs> assuming that you can always um, overlap CPU with I.O., assuming that the I.O. doesn't take a long time, assuming that, you know, when, when this, when P1 goes to I.O. Uh, and P2 gets the CPU, uh, when P2 requests I.O. again, the, the I.O. for P1 is done. So assuming that the I.O. doesn't take a long time, here, both the processes will finish faster. Why? Because we have spent less time in the kernel. The kernel has spent less time on the CPU. You can think of the kernel time as wasted time, right? So uh, less time was given to the kernel on the CPU. So assuming that the I.O. is fast enough, then you will need less time. The total time to execute both processes is going to be less. And or another way of thinking of this is thinking of it in terms of throughput. What's the total number of processes that you can complete, uh, execute it within a given period of time. Like if I, if I give you one minute, what's the total number of processes that you can complete within one minute? Here, you're going to complete more processes. Again, assuming that the I.O. Is, uh, is fast enough or the I.O. can always be overlapped with CPU. So from throughput point of view, this is better. From user responsiveness point of view, this is better. So that's why you know, I, I think the word faster here is not well defined. This is better throughput. This is better user responsiveness, or better system responsiveness from user point of view. So what would the user experience be like uh, on multi-programming? Like, <coughs> so with time sharing, we get to have like an interactive experience. We get yeah. to. So this is definitely less interactive, and if this process does not request the I.O. for a long time, then the user will feel, feel that it's slow, that the system is slow. Okay, so now the big question is, uh, the big question is, how does the operating system implement this? So the operating system needs a mechanism for <coughs> setting a limit on the time that process number one gets. So now the kernel, at this point, the kernel has the CPU. It needs a mechanism. When it gives the CPU to P1, it needs a mechanism to get the CPU back after a specific, a certain time period that is determined by the kernel. So the kernel wants to say, OK, I'm going to give P1 10 milliseconds. And after 10 milliseconds, I, the kernel, want the CPU back. So how is this implemented? This is implemented using a timed interrupt. Remember that whenever there is an interrupt, the kernel gets control. So the kernel is going to set up a timed interrupt, an interrupt that gets triggered after a certain period of time that is determined by the kernel. So the kernel is going to set a certain counter there's a certain counter in which the kernel is going to say, OK, 10 milliseconds. Of course, it's going to be in binary. So it's going to put 10 milliseconds. And then that counter will get decremented with a system clock. 
So whenever the clock ticks, that, uh, uh, that amount of time, that period, is going to be decremented from what's in the counter. And then eventually, that counter will reach 0. So when the counter reaches 0, uh, an interrupt will get, will get generated. And when that interrupt gets generated, the CPU is uh, in control again. So this is extremely important, right? Otherwise, the kernel will not have control. This is an, a, a very important mechanism that will keep the kernel in control and it will allow the kernel to uh, determine uh, how much time each process spends on the, uh, on the CPU. And obviously, you know, this ability to set up this timed interrupt or setting the value of this counter, obviously this privilege should be given only to the kernel. Uh, it shouldn't, um, a user process should not be allowed to touch that time interrupt. Right? And that's why this requires hardware support by supporting dual mode of operation. So the hardware must distinguish between the kernel, must have a way of distinguishing, or needs to have a way of distinguishing between the kernel and the user process. And that's that requires hardware support, and this is implemented uh, in uh, using the dual mode, uh, the dual mode feature, <coughs> dual mode hardware feature that is implemented by a, uh, a mode bit. So, so there is a certain bit that indicates whether we are in kernel mode or in user mode. If we are in kernel mode, <coughs> we are allowed, the kernel is allowed to execute certain privileged instructions. Among these instructions are the instructions that set up this timed interrupt, among other things. <coughs> if you are in user mode, then uh, you cannot execute the, the privileged instructions. Okay? So this is, um, you know, we talked about the, uh, the timed interrupt. Uh, so that's why, you know, the, the operating system, we can say that the operating system is interrupt-driven. And can we now summarize the, the different kinds of interrupts that we talked about? Yeah. But does the kernel have a counter itself? Or is it like... What do you mean? Is there a counter that says, oh, time's up for the kernel? Or the kernel is like... You know, like I said, the kernel is always... You know, the kernel will start, will get the CPU first, and assuming that there are no processes, no user processes, the kernel will keep the CPU forever. Ah, okay. Right? So it's, uh, so it's, you can think of it as, by default, the kernel has the CPU. But in, in, uh, in a real system, there are many processes that, uh, that are requesting the CPU. So it's, uh, the kernel you know, decides you know, which process gets the CPU and for how long. But if there are no processes, the kernel, in theory, will keep the CPU can keep it forever. Uh, so what are the four different kinds of interrupts that we have mentioned? Uh, exceptions. Okay, so exceptions. One. We have mentioned four different kinds of interrupts. Okay? What exceptions or traps, same thing. What exceptions when something wrong happens, right? When, when a process performs an invalid operation. That's what we mean. I.O. Okay, I.O. Okay, so it's the I.O. completion. When an I.O. request is completed, so that's number two. Number three? Mm -hmm. uh, time interrupt? Yeah, the time interrupt that we have just uh, described. What's the, the fourth one? Like process completion? Hmm? Like process completion? Process completion? Well, that's in fact a special case of a more general kind of interrupt that we mentioned earlier in this lecture. So what is missing? When hmm? new process comes, when new process starts, or something. request resources. System call? Oh, yeah, system call, exactly. A system call. And system calls can be made for many different reasons, including uh, you know the uh, the normal termination of a process. When a process is done, is completely done, it's going to perform 
a system call like the exit. This is a system call, so it's just telling the operating system I'm done. Okay. Uh, okay. Back. Oh no, it's, uh, that's good. So we still have a. Uh, okay, and we talked about the dual mode uh, operation. So here we just see how the dual mode works. So we have a user process that is executing in user mode. When it makes a system call, the mode bit is changed to zero to indicate kernel mode. Now the kernel is executing. When the kernel is done, it's going to set the mode bit back to one. So basically, whenever the kernel gives the, the CPU to a process, it must set the mode bit to one to indicate that it's the user that is uh, running on the system so that the hardware does not allow a user process, and this is the key idea, the user does not allow a user process to execute privileged instructions.